In this video, we'll talk about different distributed database paradigms. A key value database or a key value store is a database paradigm designed around the idea of an associative array. Associative arrays are also commonly called hash tables or in Python dictionaries. The values in a key value store can be basically anything, numbers, strings, dates, or much more complicated documents. The keys are typically chosen carefully to allow fast lookups of the data. A key in a key value store has multiple parts, which are stored as an ordered list. You could think of keys like the directory structure on your machine. For example, this is the directory where I store my lecture slides. Home identifies the top level folder, then my username, then there's some other structure before landing in the bucket where I keep these lecture slides. Typically, the first component is called a major key and the rest are called minor keys. Hopefully, it's obvious that by generating keys like this, we create a tree data structure which allows for very fast lookups. Key value stores are implemented as hash tables, where the keys are mapped to integers using a hash function. This is just a function which takes some arbitrary data object and returns a number within some range. Imagine we have some key value data store and we want to distribute this data across multiple servers. This process is sometimes called sharding. One way to do this is to use a hash function to convert the key to an integer, then take the answer modulo n to get a number between 0 and n minus 1 inclusive, then send the data to that server. The problem with this approach occurs when we add or remove a server. The server ID of every key then changes, and all of the data has to be remapped and moved around, which is not ideal. Imagine we're working with a huge and growing database stored on hundreds or thousands of servers. The number of servers will frequently expand and contract, so this remapping operation could get very expensive. The solution is an algorithm called consistent hashing. Here, the data is first mapped onto the range 0 to big int, where big int is usually a very, very large integer, something like 2 to the power of 160. Next, we map the servers into the same index space, for example, by applying a hash function to the server name. Then we apply a simple rule, using distances on the circle to pick which server to store which data on. For example, we could just take the server that's closest, going clockwise to each key. To make sure the load is balanced and no one server has to store too much data, we apply the server map a number of times. The figure shows giving each server equal weight of 2, but we could use larger numbers or even give different servers different weights. For example, if one server was more powerful than the rest, it could have a higher weight and appear more times in the index space. Let's look at remapping again. Imagine that the data is in this configuration, with three servers and the data distributed among them. What would happen if we removed the pink server? Well, firstly, all the data that was on it would need to go somewhere. According to our rule, the data goes to the next nearest clockwise server. The important thing to notice is that none of the other data has to move. A similar effect happens when we add a server. Pause and think about how that would work. In both situations, only a small subset of the data has to move, which is a huge improvement over the naive approach. Some popular implementations of key value databases are React, Redis, and Amazon's DynamoDB. The next paradigm is a document-oriented database, or document store, which is designed for storing semi-structured data. A document store is a kind of key value database, but uses properties of the document to generate the keys. Document-oriented databases usually work with objects most commonly stored in JSON format or something similar. JSON is an acronym for JavaScript Object Notation, but has nothing to do with JavaScript in particular anymore. It's now used as a general model for specifying complex documents. In your coursework, you'll see a lot of JSON documents, which is how tweets are stored. You can think of JSON documents as basically identical to Python dictionaries, though there are minor differences like capitalization of true and false for Boolean values, but otherwise they behave virtually identically. By far the most popular document store is MongoDB. Mongo uses a binary version of JSON called Bison, but you can think of Mongo documents as JSON objects without going too far wrong. Mongo uses the document fields to create keys and then indexes those keys to allow fast lookups. So remember the directory structure we talked about earlier. Mongo also has its own query language, which is fairly straightforward. It uses a dot operator to look at documents within documents, and there are various standard comparisons you can do. So this query, for example, finds documents where the class grades are passing, but less than the first. The last database paradigm I will discuss is a graph database. This is a database that uses a graph structure to make queries. We'll talk about graphs as a way to model data in much more detail in a later lecture. For now, all you need to know is that a graph database has nodes, each node can have a label as well as a number of properties which are usually stored as key value pairs. Here the node B has two properties, name and company. Node D has properties company and CEO. Nodes in a graph database are the data objects. Graphs can also have edges or links. These represent relationships between nodes. Here we see a few examples of possible relationship types. A relationship always has a direction, a type, a start node and an end node. Like nodes, relationships can also have properties. In most cases, they have numeric weights like cost, distance, or strength. 
Graph databases are less common than relational or key value databases, but they have their uses. The main one being for cases where we have lots of relationships between entities and we intend to run complex queries. Think of something like the Facebook graph. Here we have users and each user has hundreds of connections and those connections can encode all kinds of relationships between people. Well, the people themselves can have many properties such as their user info, posts, photos, and so on. Using a graph database would be a good way to organize this data for the purposes of efficiently querying the database, asking questions like, find which friends of friends of user A like page B. It's possible to write very efficient algorithms to traverse graphs to answer such questions, and we'll discuss some of them in a later lecture. Probably the most well-known graph database implementation is Neo4j. Interestingly, Neo4j and other graph databases can be made to be compliant with ACID rules, which is another reason to consider them, even if they're not quite yet as popular as some of the other database types.